Good morning, everyone from snowy Washington, D.C., and good evening to those in Japan. We appreciate you taking time to us uh, to join us for this critically important discussion this morning. My name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa USA. Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Its activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through exchanges, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. A few points before we begin today. Today's event is on the record and a written recap and video recording of the event will be posted on Sasakawa USA's website. For the Q&A portion of today's event, uh, please use the raise your hand button and uh, when called upon, please unmute yourself. And with that, let's begin. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. I am Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and the President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Since the military coup on February 1st, dozens of prominent political figures, including Dao Aung San Suu Kyi, has been detained. When the military introduced new constitution in 2009, they thought they could limit the extent of a political control by the NLD, but they clearly misestimated Do Aung San Suu Kyi's charismatic popularity on the street. We don't know what was the cause of a critical breakup of negotiation between the army and the NLD on January 31st. It is clear that the military decided they could not coexist with Do Aung San Suu Kyi and had to regain the total political control for now, at least. Now, many regular people are on the street in two largest cities, Yangon and Mandalay and other cities protesting against the coup and demanding release of the detainees in their language as well as in English. We only hope the situation, which is very tense to say the least, may not lead to crash on the street and ultimately repression by the army. We are concerned to say the least and have many important questions to ask. What is really happening in Myanmar? Is this the total reversal of the democratization movement? What's the future, future hold for Myanmar people? What does this mean to the region geopolitically? What the US and Japan can do together to help Myanmar find its way? What may be obstacle for the US and Japan to work together in an effective way? This is also a test case for new Biden administration, whether it can effectively take in balance among emphasis on human rights and democracy, relationship with allies, and realistic geopolitical interest, and also what pressure tools it is going to use in a positive way. There is a lot to hope for, and I send my best of luck to our good friend, Kirk Campbell in the administration. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our featured speaker today. With all due respect to experts on Myanmar in Washington, I feel we have the best lineup of experts on Myanmar with the US-Japan angle today. Professor David Steinberg is distinguished professor emeritus of Asia at the Georgetown University. He is the authority of Myanmar, particularly structure and the nature of governance led by Tatmatao, the army. He would give us his view on domestic political landscape in Myanmar. Minister Shinichi Ida, is head of a political department at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, DC. He handled geopolitical issues in Asia, in China division and Oceania division. He was His Majesty, the emperor's official translator from 2006 to 2016. Minister Ida will talk about his view from Japanese angle. Ambassador Derek Mitchell is president of National Democratic Institute. He was a U.S. ambassador in Yangon from 2012 to 2016. 
observing tremendous political change, including the historic general election in 2015. Ambassador Mitchell will talk about his view from the US viewpoint. <clears throat> we have a, a Myanmar ambassador in Washington, Aung Lin, in the audience. He has expressed desire to say a word with respect to Ambassador Aung Lin and Myanmar. I would like to invite Ambassador Aung Lin to make a brief comment following the three, three speakers. Professor Steinberg, floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And I'd like to provide a bit of background on the situation because we have to understand the role of the military in Myanmar if we are under, to understand the present situation. The military's influence in Myanmar has been the longest in any contemporary Asian country, perhaps in the world. They have done this through three different means, ruled by decree, through a military founded and controlled political party and through constitutional means. What I want to say is that by rule by decree, they basically set the stage politically in that country from 1958 to 1960, from 1962 to 1974, from 1988 to 2010, and 2021 to whatever. They've also done this through the political parties that they've controlled and founded. The first was the Burma Socialist Program Party from 74 to 88. Then they tried this with the National Unity Party in 1990, but that didn't work. And then in, in an election that the NLD abstained from being involved in, in the US, uh, the Union Solidarity and Development Party from 2010 to 2015. But now they have done this through constitutional means. They have devised, passed through a, uh, a manipulated referendum, a constitution that gives them control over the critical elements of the society. They have said this all along. This is nothing that isn't in their own record. Their, their goals, as I see them, are the following. The, the continuation of national security, national unity, national sovereignty. This is very important. Control over minority affairs, control over all coercive power in the state, the home ministry, which means the police and intelligence, as well as, of course, the Ministry of Defense, control over their own military affairs. The, military, the civilians will not control the internal workings of the military. Prevent change through the constitutional provisions by having a, enough in, uh, seats allocated by the military in the, the parliament so that the parliament cannot amend anything without their approval. A get out of jail free card, which allows uh, them to be free should anyone charge them for offenses of the past administrations. Explicit constitutional political role for the military, the participation of the Tamato, that is the military, in the leading role in national politics in the future, which is a quote from the Constitution, and internal stability, the prevention of chaos, which they've always feared. Democracy has never been one of the core values of the military, even though they have talked about discipline flourishing uh, democracy. Now they've had all these institutional arrangements. They have been very effective in preventing the um, opposition or any other group from controlling the legal process in that country. Then why did they bother to have a coup? in February 1st. Since they could control the country through their own constitutional means, of the coercive power. And through, and up until recently, the control of the, all the avenues of social mobility in the society, which is something that no other military in Asia, whether it's Thailand or Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Korea was able to do. And this is the question that we need to answer. Now, the military was very concerned about the 
uh, results of the 2020 election. They tried to negotiate with the NLD. Both have been extremely arrogant in dealing with each other, the leaders, we mean. This has not proven to be um, fruitful. The result has been a standoff. And in a country where personal power is far more important than institutional power, and this goes back to the foundations of the Burmese kingdoms in, a thousand years ago, power is personalized and the power of Min Aung Hlaing, the head of the army, and Aung San Suu Kyi, the head of the NLD, has been uh, paramount and antithetical to each other. So I think one of the reasons for the coup, and this is to be disputed, is that these people were on a collision course. Aung San Suu Kyi confronted the military directly, which was tactically perhaps an error, uh, and the military would not suffer that. Secondly, the military was humiliated. When we think of the military, you think in the popular press, you see questions of um, misuse of uh, legislature, funding and so forth. But the military consider themselves as patriots. They will think what they're doing is for the good of the country and for the military. And even if they are wrong in any objective measure, they still feel this. So they were humiliated by the results of the November 2020 election. A really a disastrous defeat that even the experts did not quite predict. They knew the NLD would win, but not by that margin. The NLD refused to negotiate. The military made claims that were excessive. And the result was trying to overcome this humiliation. In the days of the junta, if there was a problem, um, and the army were ridiculed, the army would simply arrest the, the comedians. And since there was complete censorship, um, these words got out, but they got out slowly and they didn't spread in society to the degree they do today. Today you have complete freedom or have had complete freedom through the internet, through social media, so that when the army is humiliated, it spreads immediately in the society. It spreads throughout the society. And this, the army did not seem to be able to tolerate. And so the coup has taken place. Now, what's the end result? Well, in a, supposedly in a year, the military says we'll have, we'll have elections, multi-party elections, and the ruling, the ruling party will take over. They did that in 1960 after constitutional coup of 1958, and the party that they did not want to win in, in 1960, in fact, did win. But the times are different today. It's much more difficult. The army talks about eternal peace, striving for eternal peace with the minorities. That's never been accomplished since independence. And I think it would be very, very difficult for the army to give up power in a year or so. They will have to find some safe saving way to do this. Maybe by changing the, purport, the election to uh, a proportional election system, whereby the minor, where the opposition uh, would get less votes and the military backed Union Solidarity and Development Party would get more votes. Uh, the minorities would have a greater role. That may be a kind of um, facile out on the uh, surface change. Uh, at the same time, I don't see the military giving up. I think since 1962, the military has determined it would retain continuous power over the things it regarded as important for the indefinite future. And I think that's what they've done. So when we talk about the transition to democracy in Myanmar, we're not talking about the transition to democracy as it's basically understood around the world, we're talking about the transition to a disciplined, flourishing democracy. And when you read, define, uh, adjectivally, the word democracy, you change it. Whether it's people's democracy, guided democracy, or disciplined, flourishing, it will be something less than those advocates of democracy want. And the military, I think, will continue to play this role. And let me end by saying, quoting, an old friend of mine, 
a man by the name of Colonel Jimong. Colonel Jimong, I'd known since 1958 when he was on the Revolutionary Council. He then became Southern Command, uh, Southern Commander. He fell out with Ne Win. He didn't agree to the Burmese way to socialism and ended up in jail. He became Aung San Suu Kyi's spokesman for the NLD and then fell out with her. But years ago, he said to me something about the role of the military that I think sums it all up. He said, David, he said, the play is over, but the audience is forced to remain in their seats and the actors refuse to leave the stage. And I'd like to close there with that unfortunately a pessimistic note. David, uh, Professor Steinberg, uh, thank you very much for your insight based on uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, involvement and the uh, research uh, in the country. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Minister Ida uh, now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akimoto. Uh, good morning in the US and good evening in Japan. As I introduced, uh, my name is Shinichi Ida, Political Minister of the Japanese Embassy. I'd like to express my deep appreciation uh, once again to Dr. Akimoto and Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA for affording this opportunity to me. I consider it really precious. Also, I also would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Steinberg from whose presentation I have already learned a great deal. And also Ambassador Mitchell, uh, whose reputation proceeds as an experienced diplomat. I am uh, honored by their presence and feeling even overwhelmed uh, by, the, by, by them. Today's topic is Myanmar. As uh, Dr. Akimoto indicated at the outset, my task is to give uh, some presentation mainly from the uh, uh, Japan US angle. But prior to it, uh, let me uh, briefly refer to the country itself. Myanmar shares the borders with China, India, and Thailand. It is often called uh, by a lot of experts and others a geopolitical foreground because it is where East Asia, to which Japan belongs, meets with Southeast Asia and South Asia, the regions which are extremely important for Japan as well as for the international community. Without the peace and prosperity of Myanmar, in our view, peace and prosperity of the Indochina Peninsula as a whole would be impossible to attain. I'm not exaggerating. Moreover, the democratic transition in Myanmar, which Japan and the US, as well as the intercommunity inter as a whole, has been helping to proceed, is extremely important from the viewpoint of free and open Indo Pacific strategy, or FOIP, if I may use abbreviation strategy. The FOIP or free and open Indo-Pacific strategy is far more than a mere political slogan. It's a vision statement, if you will, that the region must be free and open. And if that's not the case, we must uh, strive to make it free and open by diplomatic endeavors and other means. We are convinced that this is the best path to ensure the peace and prosperity of the region are consistent with the interest of the countries therein. We are glad that the uh, new Biden administration uh, also embraces the FOIP strategy as well. We regard it as one of the main pillars in managing Japan uh, and developing uh, Japan-US alliance. The recent military coup in Myanmar uh, poses serious challenges in two folds. One is to the geograph geopolitical importance of Myanmar, and the other uh, is to the promotion of FOIP strategy. What is called for is for us to side with Myanmar as a country and its people 
in particular. In so doing, it is critically important for Japan and the US to continue to encourage them to take steps towards democratization, to attain democracy, which is a common value uh, that Japan and the US fully share. That is the bottom line. We should revert to it uh, uh, again and again. Let me uh, put the entire picture into a historical perspective, if you will, particularly the historical perspective of Japan, US, and world. As you may, many of you may know, there's a long history of exchanges uh, between Japan and the US over Myanmar. Dr. Akimoto kindly mentioned uh, to my Korea as His Majesty's interpreter. But prior to it, when I was uh, young and energetic uh, uh, diplomat in the 1990s, I was an official interpreter for the Japanese prime ministers, as well as for the foreign ministers. And I had uh, a lot of privilege to attend uh, both to Japan, US summits and the foreign ministers meeting. In such occasions, I witnessed in my own eyes, straightforward, sometimes too straightforward exchanges over Myanmar between the very high level people of the two countries. Of course, one of them was Secretary Martin Albright, who I understand is a good mentor for Ambassador Derek Mitchell. She was particularly overwhelming according to my experiences, but of course, in a very good way. But let's not forget, Japan and the US never failed to maintain close communication on Myanmar. Frankly, our policies differed from time to time. As a result of pursuing our respective policies, however, Myanmar began the democratization process in 2010. Of course, cooperation with other international partners, ASEAN in particular, was also essential. Let me further refer to an episode of a couple of years ago with regard to the situation in the Rakhine state. The international community, justifiably, strongly criticized our state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD government at that time. But, but Japan took a slightly different stance. We assisted the Independent Commission of Inquiry and encouraged Myanmar's own initiative. In our view, democracy is taking root in Myanmar and this trend is irreversible. It takes time for democracy to mature which also requires a great degree of our patience. This is also an important aspect of the issue. Referring specifically to the military coup on February 1st, immediately after the coup, the government of Japan issues a statement expressing condemnation against the coup. Japan has been publicly and continually urging the military to immediately cease evaluate responses to civilians, to release the detainees, including Aung San Suu Kyi, and simply uh, restore democratic regime. In their call on February 10th, Foreign Minister Motegi and Secretary Blinken reaffirmed that Japan and the US are in complete agreement in those regards. Please uh, uh, take, take a moment to double check the uh, Japan's official statements. Also the US official statements uh, uh, right after the military coup, because they are, you, will, you, you will find they are almost identical. Let's not forget furthermore, that it was Japan and the US that strongly criticized the military authorities ahead of any 
in the country when the peaceful demonstrators in Myanmar were shot. I can assure you that Japan and the US is in very close communication over the situation in Myanmar, in Tokyo, in Yangon, and here in Washington DC as well. <clears throat> I am the one who is in very close contact with my colleagues in the State Department and also in the White House. I hope they are not feeling even harassed by me. We share the full recognition uh, under the current circumstances that Myanmar is a very important issue for Japan, US alliance as well. At the same time, however, despite its importance, Myanmar is not the only issue that requires attention. The list is very long, the whole range of issues that require a close uh, Japan-US close cooperation, from the response to COVID-19 and climate change, to East and South China Seas, and North Korea. A short moment ago, the foreign minister of Japan and the US, India, and Australia had the virtual meeting. This is the second Quad Foreign Minister's meeting uh, from the one Japan hosted in October last year. We'd like to uh, further develop uh, this uh, Quad process. And there is a great potential in our view uh, in this Quad process as well. With that positive note, please let me conclude my initial remarks. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I would be very happy to feed the questions later in this session. Thank you again. Thank you, Minister Ida. I would like to uh, uh, commend uh, uh, your courage and the determination to uh, uh, speak about uh, very complicated and uh, difficult issues in the public fora. And uh, uh, my uh, uh, heartfelt thanks uh, to you uh, to uh, uh, accept the role. Of, uh, of this panel. So thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, uh, Derek, uh, Ambassador uh, Mitchell. Well, thank you, uh, Satohiro. Good morning to folks back here and uh, good evening to those in Japan and maybe elsewhere. Um, I wanna thank the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA for organizing this. Uh, I wanna pay my regards as always to Dr. Steinberg who, uh, who provides really essential context Every time he opens his mouth, I, I learn more about what Burma, historic Burma and Myanmar. Uh, and I think what he laid down in terms of context is always critical when we have discussions like this to know what we're talking about. Minister Aida, I join what others have said in terms of uh, uh, your courage in doing this. It's not easy for a diplomat in Washington to speak on the record on these topics, but you are a great friend of the Alliance and a great partner to, to us in America. And it's wonderful to have you in Washington. So thank you. Um, and let me also say uh, hello to everybody I see, at least who has signed up and some I know who have actually patched in or a lot of old friends that I don't see as much as I used to and we're valued partners in the US-Japan Alliance work. It's great to see all of you and hopefully I'll get to see you again very soon, either through a box or maybe someday even in person. The um, interesting thing about Sasakawa Peace Foundation, I'd, I should say as well, as we talk about US-Japan cooperation in Myanmar is that this is a, a foundation, a, a forum underwritten by Sasakawa Yohei, um, who also underwrites the Nippon Foundation. And it, it, he himself is a very important player in Myanmar. He's, he's the man that has worked very closely with uh, the, uh, the military and on peace work, uh, even more so in some ways than the embassy out there. It is Sasakawa Yohei who is um, who has been intimately involved with the ethnic nationalities in the country and involved in the peace work. So he has become a, a very good friend of mine as well. I wanna send my regards to him and thank him for underwriting all this work and for his amazing uh, investment in, in Myanmar's very tortured uh, history of late. Um, and clearly this issue is of great personal interest to me as well as professional. Um, but I think as Dr. Steinberg, David outlined, um, it, it, we had no illusions about the situation we found ourselves in going into this election and where we are now. I don't think many people, I mean, some people, you know, may have felt the, uh, a coup may be coming, 
The specter of the military was always hanging over the civilian government uh, ever since 2015, 2016, ever since they won the election in 2015. There were rumors about the military hovering and the NLD was saying continually they worried about uh, the military and they couldn't do certain things because the military was there to step in at any wrong step. Um, but I think it still did surprise us uh, that it happened when it did. And it, I think some of the factors that, that David outlined at the top uh, likely informed that very unfortunate decision uh, so that we are where we are. Um, but you know, the United States, our investment in Myanmar um, was back when I was doing it was because we saw an opening. We saw there was something changing there. We saw there was an opportunity to perhaps reframe and put American foreign policy and uh, whatever soft power we had uh, to invest in, um, in whatever opening there might be, an opportunity there was, and we did see progress. There was never a moment of euphoria. There was never a moment where we thought this was done. Um, there may have been some in the media and some people who mischaracterized it as something irreversible and uh, completely different. But really what happened in 2015 in the election was simply an election for part of the government, as Dr. Steinberg uh, op uh, opened by saying. Um, and it meant that the problems of the country, the longest running civil war in the world, the lack of capacity, the degradation of institutions, uh, a constitution that, is lead, that has a lot of benefits for the military, all of this, all of these problems are now in the, you know, now have to be handled by the civilians. Now that's the NLD's job to deal with it. Uh, that's the only thing that changed. Nothing else fundamentally changed. The, the constitution didn't change, the foundations of the country, the mindsets didn't change uh, within the military or otherwise. Um, and so we knew it was a necessary but not sufficient moment in this uh, evolution, this history of modern Myanmar. Um, and it then had to be turned over to the, the relationship between the civilians and the military to work out the next phase on this very difficult journey. And we knew that uh, it was going to be difficult, um, that all of this was going to be very difficult to manage. Um, so, you know, the, the um, you know, when the United States thinks about it, historically has dealt on policy towards Myanmar, it largely had focused on Aung San Suu Kyi. It had largely focused on the democratic movement. Uh, today, I think it's a bit different, it's evolved. She's still very important because she is the democratic choice of the people. It's always essentially why we focused on her aside from her being a symbol of democracy in the old days, an icon of democracy. But at the core of it, she, the reason why we backed her, uh, at least it should be, is because she was the democratic choice. We knew that from the 1990, even when she was under house arrest, her party won the election because they wanted her. She was, a she was Aung San's daughter and she represented democracy. That remains the, the focus now. So when people take to the street and they, they show her face and they do want to back Mother Sue, they, but they also, this is what the people in the streets saw was an attack on them. They saw an attack on the country, an attack on democracy, an attack on their dignity, on their choice, on their freedom, all the, the, the opening and, the, and the, um, you know, what they experienced, particularly young people in the past 10 years. They heard from their parents, they may have experienced some of military dictatorship, but what, uh, what they were able to achieve in the past 10 years was a taste of this freedom and this opening, uh, and they, didn't want, they don't wanna go back. And you see it in uh, the millions of people all over the country. Um, you know, I like to say that you know, the military always talks about, as David Steinberg said, national unity, where they achieved it by doing this. They've unified the entire country against them. Um, and they're, it's being seen every single day that what has happened is, is, uh, is not acceptable to the people of the country. And we must stand by them. We must continue to, to show our solidarity with them. Uh, and I think today we have much more of a sophisticated understanding and many more relationships in Myanmar so that it isn't a one person policy, uh, but it is about the broader sweep of issues. I should also add that as suggested by uh, Minister Ida, there, it is a strategic location, a strategic place. And I think we also recognize that it is the crossroads of Asia. It is the missing piece of ASEAN. If you wanna have a normal relationship with ASEAN and you wanna engage them, we knew in the old days that having a closed relationship, an unnatural relationship with Myanmar uh, hamstrung us 
in engaging ASEAN, and it now potentially might, uh, might again, at least to some degree. Um, it has poten tremendous potential with its natural resources. Um, and there is a concern about, I think more with Japan's, as Japan thinks about it, and Japan thinks about Chinese sphere of influence. We think about Chinese sphere of influence. The access to the Indian Ocean is a great concern to the Indians in particular. When China is working in Chokpu and Rakhine State, that's what the Indians are most concerned about. Um, and increased Chinese influence is, uh, is something I think that frankly uh, caused the turn uh, from the, by the Myanmar government and particularly the military to open up and want to have a better relationship with the United States. The irony of this is not that, well, if as some in Japan will say, that if we uh, isolate or we um, punish the military, they will turn to China. In fact, they, they might have to turn to China, but the military is not happy with China. This is a military that fought China. They, their comrades at a certain, of a certain age died at the hands of, of Chinese armed rebels and maybe some Chinese mercenaries. They know China is continuing to provide weapons uh, to the ethnic nationality uh, or armed organizations um, that are fighting and, and killing the military. And they feel Chinese, you know, as a very proud, the military being a very proud repository guarantor of national sovereign independence and uh, defense of, of uh, their independence generally. Um, they're very wary of Chinese influence. So uh, pushing them towards China in a way may be something that is a leverage point against them, even as risky as that may be and as un unfortunate as that would, would be for the people of Myanmar, they clearly do not want that. And they're out in the streets protesting against it. But in fact, now, um, you know, I, would, I wanna address some of what, I was gonna say this anyway, addressing some of what Mr. Aida had said. There is a history in Japan of, uh, you know, today they talk about the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, when I was looking at US-Japan in the first Abe years, in the 2000s in the Bush administration, that was termed the arc of freedom and prosperity, very similar kind of thing. But back in the 2000s, just like today, I, as I uh, think about those terms and I probe deeply, what do you mean by this? Uh, to, to my Japanese partners, at least, what is that agenda? I get a sense that free means as much free trade and open as, means as much open sea lanes as it does democracy and human rights. Now, if you, if you rub beneath the surface and just being very open about this, that yes, you know, we wanna support these things. These are all good things and we're a democracy, that's fine. But really it, it's more about the traditional Japanese view that we wanna secure Asia, open sea lanes for, for free trade, um, for our economic and business interests, that work for us at home, and just generally uh, how we view the Asian, uh, what, what Asian interests are, kind of traditional Asian view, uh, if I may say. Uh, it's not really fair. There's, there's a lot of Asian views. They have a Korean uh, Kim Dae-jung view. There's a lot of debate. I understand that. But the, the elite view typically is very much standing on the two pillars of business and security and not democracy and human rights. And I, um, I think today is a different moment. And Japan needs to think differently about it. Um, and I, I do believe the Japanese government is starting to think in these terms pushed by the United States and the Biden administration. There is a Biden doctrine now. Um, they haven't called it maybe a Biden doctrine quite yet, but I would see a Biden doctrine having two, uh, at least two pillars, but two big pillars that you hear all the time. Um, uh, and maybe you can say three. One is you know, American leadership. There, you know, the, the international um, system doesn't organize itself. So America has to lead. Number two is that um, America, uh, that values must be a centerpiece to our foreign policy. Um, that unity, uh, that, that, um, that uh, uh, values, there's, a, there's a, a, a competition globally between free societies and closed societies, between democracy and autocracy that is embodied by China in many ways because China has the most resources, they have the most, the biggest global reach. We can see it through Russia, I can see it through Turkey, Saudi. There's, a, there's just something happening today that is now a new twilight struggle that is in some ways even broader than a single country, but it goes to the norms, standards, values, and rules uh, of the international system. So when Japan talks about a rules-based order, 
what you know we're defining those in terms of these very fundamental values of democracy, transparency, accountability, uh, and governance, uh, democratic governance. Um, and the other pillar here is allies. When we talk about a Biden doctrine. We're going to need our allies. America is not the hyperpower anymore. That we can't do this ourselves, and we never could, frankly, do it all, all ourselves. Um, but other countries can simply say, well, over to you, America, to do it. We truly need our allies and partners, and we're, we're appealing to them to assist. Um, and, and Myanmar is really the first test. We've heard this before, but I really do believe this is the first test of uh, this Biden doctrine. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot um, uh, on, on the line to get this right. And I don't think, I agree that with democracy, you have to be patient. With a country that has dug such a hole that, that uh, Myanmar has, that one election in one moment is not going to bring democracy. It's not going to, we have to be patient, um, but it has to stay on track. And we shouldn't be patient to the, to the degree that we simply uh, sit back and watch and say, well, a coup is a coup. That's what happens sometimes in these circumstances. Uh, the, if the, the uh, as, as the line goes, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, you have to bend that arc yourselves. You have to, we have to help bend that arc. Uh, through proactive activity. And we must do that, I think, as the free and open countries, as allies urgently today to assist. I'm not suggesting that we are going, we may, we are going to make the determinative dis, uh, difference in Myanmar. As Dr. Steinberg said, this is going to be very difficult to reverse, uh, but uh, we must, must show that we are not doing business as usual and we take tangible hard steps um, that are focused, that are not going to hit the people of the country, but are focused on the military, that are creative, we do, where we maybe co coordinate our approach. We don't have to do exactly the same thing. Um, the, the thing that Japan has that the United States does not have now is you have, Japan has very good relationships, relationships of trust, including uh, Sasakawa Yohei, as well as our ambassador out there, Murayama, as well as the government. That is a good thing. Japan has always been about a step ahead of us, even when I was doing you know, the work and reforming the American policy or revising American policy. Um, Japan was always a step ahead and I always thought that was good. We need to continue to have those relationships, but there needs to be a little bit of muscle behind this engagement, some real muscle if we're gonna make a difference. And if the US and Japan can get this right as an alliance and figure out how we do this together, we can then reach out to the Indians and the Quad being a very important institution to, to bring to the fore on this, again, as a, as a foundation for uh, broader work uh, during a Biden administration at a critical moment uh, for, for the world, I would say. So um, really that's, that's mostly what I wanted to say. I think that um, I, my instincts are as an alliance builder, a US-Japan alliance guy. Um, I don't know that there was a lot that we did um, in a determinative way when I was ambassador. You know, I, I would coordinate with Japan some, but uh, Japan had its own route. We had ours. They were generally in the same direction. And I thought it was very positive. I think we're in a different place now. Where we have to be lockstep. Um, and uh, we need to be urgently uh, address this issue. Um, ultimately, it will be up to the people of the country. And you're seeing daily the people in the streets and they're taking names of countries. Which countries are with us? Who's going to stand by us? You're, seeking, you're seeing also populations around the world. Uh, in Singapore, I just saw people are looking to potentially even boycott Singapore businesses that will just go along. Um, this is time, I think, to think fresh on, on this. And I do hope that the US and Japan can work together, both vocally and quietly, uh, to, to get Myanmar back on track in their very difficult journey to democracy. Uh, that they themselves are fighting so hard and suffered so much to achieve. So with that, I turn back over to you, Satyar. Well, thank you very much, Derek. I really appreciate it. Now, you pointed out uh, uh, power and effectiveness of uh, Japan and the United States have unified uh, uh, front, but at the same time, uh, uh, cast a light on the uh, point of uh, possible uh, diversion uh, between the two countries. Minister Ida, uh, um, Ambassador Mitchell, Derek also pointed out uh, um, Kind of definition of uh, free and open uh, uh, in the Pacific. And uh, um, do you uh, would you like to make a comment on the on that particular point? 
the uh, print the meaning of print open is uh, uh, meaning and print open is uh, very important because uh, we view it as self-explanatory, but at the same time, uh, we uh, really wanted to maintain the aspect of print and open uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 the Indo-Pacific strategy. And, uh, and uh, as I mentioned in passing in my uh, first presentation, a quad process uh, will uh, continue, to, uh, will uh, play a central role uh, in uh, achieving the uh, free and free and open, free and open in the Pacific. And in that context, uh, I just uh, I got a readout from the uh, quad foreign ministers meeting. And uh, I'm happy to report to all of you that uh, uh, foreign minister Mutigi uh, raised the issue of Myanmar and he, uh, he, he, uh, he again uh, strongly emphasized the need for the immediate cessation of the violent response to the civilians, immediate release of the uh, detainees, including Aung San Suu Kyi, and the restoration of the democratic regime. And the four, four foreign ministers uh, completely agreed to what uh, our foreign minister Motegi of Japan um, uh, raised with regard to the situation of Myanmar. So, uh, uh, obviously, the four, uh, quad, the quad countries are Japan, US, Australia, and let's not forget India is a very important partner of the quad. So I, I'm sure and I hope that quad process will also be instrumental uh, in, uh, in facilitating the early recovery of the democratic regime of the Myanmar. I, I uh, answered in a, a slightly different angle, but that's my response at the moment. Thank you. We have a uh, uh, lots of questions, and uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, have a first question uh, from uh, Dr. Robert Donner of the Atlantic Council. This is a question to David, uh, Dr. Steinberg. How unified and cohesive is the military, particularly in the face of widespread uh, popular opposition, with the commanders and the rank of file still hold together today if forced to use force against citizens? David. That is a critical question, and I think very appropriate one to ask. In the past, there have been problems with military cohesion, but as a leading Burmese journalist told me years ago, the military need each other. Military uh, control, influence in that society depends on their unity. If the unity is split, then all the mechanisms that they have built to maintain the autonomy of the military and its role will fall apart. Now that is a very delicate situation. And there could be a circumstance where the military unity would fail. For example, if the military like in 1988 began to indiscriminately open fire on the population, there may be elements of the military that would not agree to that that would not do that. And the military could be a, a step of something. This is the most heinous crime in the early days of the imprisonment of Aung San Suu Kyi was trying to split the military. So the question is right. Right now, the military seems united, but that is a very delicate situation. And we don't know whether that will last. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from uh, uh, um, Satu Limaye of the uh, uh, East West Center. Will, should, how the US and Japan curtail relationship with ASEAN if ASEAN does not take action in response to coup? This is a question to uh, both uh, 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 and uh, uh, Minister Ida. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akimoto. Uh, that's a critical question. And uh, uh, Myanmar, when J Myanmar joined, ASEAN in the late 1990s, uh, that was a crucial moment that in the end uh, led to the beginning of democratization uh, in uh, 2010. ASEAN's role, as I mentioned in passing in my first remarks, is crucial by uh, restoring democracy, restoring democracy in, in, in Myanmar. And uh, Japanese Foreign Minister Motegi talked with the uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN uh, counterparts on this over the situation in Myanmar. He just did it with the uh, Indonesian Indonesian foreign minister uh, the other day, and uh, we will continue to urge uh, ASEAN countries uh, to work on the uh, situation in Myanmar as uh, good friends of, of that country. That is critical. 
And uh, let's not forget the uh, Myanmar immediately reacted, even though the content, uh, the content of the statement was not necessarily uh, uh, strong enough in the views of some, but let's not forget they immediately reacted uh, once, the, uh, once the military coup d'etat broke out in that country. So uh, Japan and the US uh, must uh, continue to be in close cooperation uh, with the ASEAN uh, and continue to remind them the situation in Myanmar is an issue of their own. Thank you. Derek? Um, well, it, it seems to me watching ASEAN's reaction, it's evolving, which is encouraging. I mean, as, as suggested at first, there were uh, many of the countries were quite loath to say anything the Philippines had said internal matter and they switched. And they're now saying this is very concerning. You're seeing countries talk among themselves, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia saying we need to have a special meeting on this, Brunei um, seeming to agree with that. That's all encouraging. The question for Satu, I mean, it's you talk about what we do if they don't take action. The question is what action might we expect from them um, and what would cross a line? I think so far we should, you know, it's, it's been somewhat encouraging in its evolution. We should see what comes out of their conversation. Uh, we should very much encourage them to have uh, strong representations um, to, to the leadership. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I think individual countries will do things differently. I'm not sure we should expect ASEAN to take any particular action. And I do think we should preserve our relationship with ASEAN, but it naturally will, will degrade if there's one country that has regressed so substantially uh, on, on um, these fundamental values. So, um, and obviously there are other countries in, in ASEAN that are not exactly democratic either. So we have to be very, um, I think, uh, look at ASEAN and be very managed in our expectations of them, see how much we can get from them and then work individual country by individual country to see if as a coalition, we can move the military at least sooner rather than later and allow them to, don't allow them to feel that they have a year or more to wait this out. Thank you. Next question is from uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Cronin of Hudson Institute. Um, Pat uh, actually addressed this question to uh, uh, Minister Ida, but I'd like to uh, uh, expand the scope of questions so that uh, we can also hear from uh, 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 Derek and possibly uh, uh, from uh, David as well. What steps of democratization uh, would uh, Japan and the United States would like to see, given uh, uh, David Steinberg's depiction of Myanmar as a type of guarded non-democracy? David, would you like to take a crack first? <laughs> this is difficult because we do have two, uh, three factors in the United States operating. We have the Congress. And we know from past history that the Congress has been most supportive of Aung San Suu Kyi, and Derek Mitchell himself has been the most ardent supporter in the Congress of Aung San Suu Kyi. So the Congress wants some sort of action that the US government has to take. Second, the media talks about democracy in very loose terms, very not very effective in terms of making policy, but we have to pay attention to them because they are influential. And third, we have the administration. And this administration has been very careful in its imposition of sanctions. I, and I approved of the Obama administration's actions. I think that the Clinton and Bush administration's policies were regime change, which was not effective. Obama wanted regime reform. He didn't call it that, but that's what it was. And it got at least some of that. I think we need to see now some movement that is credible, but there will always be the problem in the background for the United States is the, are the Rohingya, which don't enter into our conversation at the moment, but are a backdrop. It's a backdrop because of Aung San Suu Kyi's reputation has fallen so low overseas, not internally. And it's a backdrop because we hope and would like to see far more liberalization of the Rohingya issue than the Burmese government is likely to allow. Thank you very much. Derek? Uh, sorry, get this right. Um, 
So just to get the question right, it's what uh, what steps should the what step of a democratization uh, yeah. the United States would like to see? Right. I mean, this gets complicated too, uh, in the sense that you know the I ideal situation, at least currently, is to go back to the status quo ante, just to go back to the election, accept the election. Um, and even when under the NLD, there weren't steps towards democratization or freedom that we would have wanted to see, changing the old legacy laws, um, you know, the, the laws against sort of free speech and that were limiting free media um, and such, that those are the types of things we would want to see, whether it's a military government or, or a civilian government. But in terms of um, now what we want to see, it's harder because this is kind of a watershed. Um, I'm not sure people will accept a constitution that allows, it seems to allow the military to have this type of control or ability to, to, uh, to force democracy backward so easily. It doesn't mean militaries can't do coups regardless of constitutions or, or laws, but um, you know, the question is, let's just say the military says, okay, we're open to talking about this. What precisely would the negotiation and discussion be about? Um, and, and what would be the nature of that conversation? It would have to include Aung San Suu Kyi. I'm not sure they will accept Aung San Suu Kyi or the NLD going forward as any part of any resolution. That won't be accepted by the people. But in any democracy, you have to allow for just, you know, all political parties to contest equally. So, I mean, what types of steps do we want to take in the near term in terms of this coup? I think you have to at least set up a, a reasonable conversation between the two. But it's very hard for me to even think about what that resolution would look like at this point, given how deeply um, uh, damaged that relationship between the military and the NLD is, and between the commander in chief and Aung San Suu Kyi. And over the longer term, we'd simply want to see um, a, a deepening uh, of, uh, of reform, uh, a development of the institutions, political parties, legislatures, uh, free speech, free media, um, which weren't happening uh, as, it, as it should have before in, in simple uh, capacity building over time. That's what we want to see in democracy. And it's about chipping away very, very steadily because none of that is going to happen overnight. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Ida. Dr. Takimoto, thank you. If I may supplement what have already, what has already been said, by uh, Dr. Steinberg and Ambassador, Ambassador Mitchell. Uh, you know, Japan uh, has uh, patiently maintained the contact uh, with the uh, Myanmar, Myanmar military and as well as uh, the political leadership for a very long time throughout 1990s and early 2000s, which in the end uh, led to the beginning of democratization in 20, 2010. What, we've been, uh, what uh, we were doing throughout that process is to communicate the message uh, to the military, the military leadership as well as to other people that democracy is not only an elevated ideal, but also a practical approach uh, to uh, develop uh, the nation, uh, to attain the sustainable development of the, of the country uh, in a resilient manner. So the conviction, uh, in other words, the conviction that democracy is good for them them meaning not only the political leadership, but also for ordinary people is extremely important, extremely important in uh, letting the democracy take root in any country, uh, in any country. So in addition to those uh, steps and uh, measures mentioned by Ambassador Mitchell and Dr. Stein, uh, uh, Steinberg, I'd like to really reiterate the importance of the conviction amongst the political leadership, as well as the ordinary people, that democracy is actually very good for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question is from Dr. Uh, uh, Thomas Simkin of uh, Bush School of Government, Government and uh, Public Policy at the Texas n &M. And this is uh, uh, for you, uh, David. How can the US influence the course of event in Myanmar without pushing uh, Myanmar into China's orbit? <laughs> That's that, uh, a critical question. Of course, there is no simple answer to that question. But there is, we have very little leverage, if you will. China regards that whole mainland Southeast Asia as their sphere of influence. They regard the US-Japan alliance as attempts to contain them in Myanmar and 
elsewhere in the Sengaku Islands and so forth. So it is very difficult. Aung San Suu Kyi said, commonsensically, we need good relations with China. That is absolutely correct. But they know that Myanmar historically has always wanted to be neutral. I mean, think, why did U Thant become Secretary General of the United Nations? I mean, he was no more intelligent or less intelligent than other people, but he was the representative at the UN of the quintessential neutralist country that the East and West could agree on. That was important. And I think that's what Myanmar wants today. So yes, there are a lot of people who want to see the US take an active role. I had an email from somebody this morning who implied that US troops would be a good idea. I think that is a silly comment. But at the same time, it indicates an emotion. And that emotion is very important that we, we understand. So I don't, see, uh, I don't see an end to this. I think we should exert as much pressure as we can. I think the limited individual sanctions are appropriate. I think uh, banning of arms sales is, is necessary. Uh, and I think we ought to work, as Derek said, with our allies in the region and elsewhere on trying to have a concerted approach. But the military must feel that there is a way out for them that is not humiliating. That's a cardinal principle of negotiation. You know, I like to quote the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, a famous Chinese novel. But uh, Chukou Liang says somewhere in there, I read it 60, 70 years ago, if when I surround the city, I need one, leave one gate unguarded. The enemy needs a, a way out and we must give the military a discreet way out which will benefit the people of the country, not just the military. And that is very, very difficult to do. Thank you very much. Derek? Let me pick up on that last comment too, <laughs> uh, before I get to the, China. I know we're running out of time, but I mean, this is the challenge and this is where I see Japan helping, I hope, uh, in this. And that was another question of what, what we expect from Japan in this is because the United States doesn't have really good relations with the military. We don't have the relationships we used to have, or even then, who knows if they would trust us with the, the kind of conversation we need to have. But people like potentially Sasakawa Yohei or others in the Japanese government, we need to know what it is the military, would the military want a way out? Is there an opening? Is there flexibility? That's what we just don't know now. We absolutely should give the military an ability to step back or stand, stand down without humiliation, if that's their desire. But we don't have any sense of whether there is, they have any desire for that. Every day they seem to be digging in even further. And what I've been looking for is any signal that suggests they, they are looking for an, a way out and they may have miscalculated. <clears throat> so as they see millions of people take to the streets, I hope they do come to that conclusion somehow. Um, and then the question will be, how can we constructively engage or find out exactly what it is that they need to both not humiliate, but also take care of that interest for uh, their own prerogatives, the sovereign independence, all of that, that they want to protect um, and still get democracy back on track, which gets to the issue of China, which is, I mean, pushing them to Chinese orbit, they don't want to be in Chinese orbit. I mean, the reason, as I said earlier, I think they want to have, as David Steinberg said, they want a balanced foreign policy. <clears throat> I think they reached out to us 10 years ago or opened up to us um, because they did not want to rely on one huge neighbor. They are a, you know, 55, 56 million people surrounded by 3 billion. I mean, we talk about Korea, you know, they're concerned about Japan, China, Russia. I mean, you look at, uh, you look at Burma, Myanmar, and they're facing a very difficult neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. So they're not looking to, to move to China. In fact, they're afraid of that. Um, and what we need to do, I think China gets an advantage if there is an autocratic regime and they have a, more of a disadvantage uh, generally, though we hadn't seen in recent years, if there's a more open society. Thank you very much. Uh, um, we have a lot, of, uh, uh, lot more questions to ask, but uh, uh, unfortunately we're getting close to the uh, time. Uh, time up. 
Uh, I see, uh, uh, I'd like to recognize one person from Japan attending, uh, uh, Honorable Yoshimasa Hayashi, a member of uh, Upper House, and uh, it is very late in Tokyo. Would you like to uh, say a word or, word or uh, I, don't, I, I don't mean to put you in the spot, but uh, I just saw your face. Thank you, uh, Doctor. And uh, good morning from here. Here is good evening. But thank you very much for letting me in and so many friends in Washington, DC. And here in Japan, the, the media is focusing on the relationship between the coup and China. So uh, this is very nice to hear your specialist uh, uh, deep insight about the uh, uh, relationship between China and uh, Myanmar's uh, military, they fought. And those uh, history, historical point is really missing in Japanese uh, uh, media treatment of these issues. So I hope that like uh, Minister Eida says, uh, rightly, that uh, this is the test stone for uh, US-Japan alliance uh, uh, under the new uh, administration in the United States. So I do hope that the light step towards the uh, uh, democracy, like uh, uh, Ambassador Lin says, uh, uh, for going forward uh, with the uh, help of uh, everybody, including US and Japan as a lie. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to continue the event uh, uh, for uh, uh, another hour or two, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we have come to the point we must conclude the event. Uh, changes to Myanmar may come uh, painfully slowly. Uh, there will be lots of uh, ups and downs in the long winding road. I hope that the US and Japan can cooperate to help Myanmar navigate this very difficult path. Uh, I will promise that uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, all the speakers back and uh, uh, continue this uh, discussion uh, in a positive uh, uh, fashion. Uh, we need to keep engaging uh, 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 Myanmar and we need to keep engaging uh, young people. Uh, as well as uh, 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 all the uh, uh, institutions uh, in Myanmar. So thank you very much for joining and uh, uh, have a good day. Bye-bye.